here, there's these big giant um, penguin nests that can last for so many years. But unfortunately, they're, of course, now they're endangered, so that population has plummeted. Um, right now, it's estimated that there's just over about 10,000 penguin pairs left in South Africa. So luckily, as a zoo, we work with different conservation partners throughout the world. We work with over 70 different ones. And related to the African penguin, we work with an organization called SANCOB. And it's an organization dedicated to saving seabirds off the coast of South Africa, specifically African penguins. Um, so they have an awesome research facility, but also a rehabilitation facility. So something that happens a lot of times is these guys get in trouble, not only with oil spills, but as far as human interactions go, overfishing has created a huge problem for these guys. Um, so of course, if there's not a lot of fish left after those big fishing boats come by with their giant nets, these guys go through something where they lose all of their bottoms at once, and then they grow brand new bottoms. So it's called a molt, and they do it about once a year. And Wahoo, you know, he lives at the zoo, he gets a consistent diet every single day. He does the same thing still. They're gonna lose their feathers and grow new ones so that when they're out swimming in the ocean, their body is still completely waterproof. But in order to go through that, if you can imagine if you lost all of your hair one day and had to grow it all back, it's gonna be pretty energetically expensive. It's gonna take a lot from you. So um, Wahoo here will actually gain about three pounds. I know it doesn't sound a lot for him, but he is formally around six, seven pounds. So add three pounds to his body. He is eating about 25 fish at least per serving. So typically he's gonna eat about eh, 10 to 12. Um, so you're more than doubling that. And these guys are getting ready to molt because out in South Africa, if you don't have feathers all over your body, if you don't have a nice waterproof coating, are you gonna be able to jump in the water and catch your fish? No. So these guys are stuck on land for about three weeks. Now they may eat enough to start that molt, but if they don't have enough energy left over, they can't grow all of their new feathers back. So by working with Sam Cobb and their awesome rehabilitation center, they have volunteers and workers on the ground that can find these stranded little half-naked penguins. Looks kind of cute, but of course we know they're, they're in trouble. So they go back to the rehab center, get fattened up, which is all they need, um, and then they are re-released back into their native site where they were from. Uh, so we're really lucky to work with Sam Cobb as a zoo sponsor, so just by a zoo conservation partner. Uh, so just by having us here today, you guys are actually helping contribute to our conservation fund. Um, but one more thing before Wahoo goes, when we are out at grocery stores, um, we can actually help penguins all around the world. So um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium actually created, it's called a seafood watch guide. And it's an easy little PDF that you can save on your phone when you go grocery shopping. And it's a quick little let list. Yes, absolutely, this is a super great option to buy. No, maybe not. These populations of fish aren't super stable, so let's leave enough out in the oceans for those that wildlife. And then there's a no, please don't buy that at all. We're going to contribute to the program, to the uh, to the problem. So. Really lucky to have our African penguins here. Has anyone heard of an African do any other programs with our animal boarders? You might be able to meet one of his other friends. Um, but it's quick, quick and easy thing when you guys go to the zoo. If you see, if you saw his little name band on his right flipper, uh, yeah, all the boys have their name band or their colored band on their right flipper. All the girls have them on the left. So if you come back to the zoo and you're looking at our humble penguins, same thing for them, and if you say, for example, you see a penguin with a left yellow band and a, another one that has a yellow band on their right, that's a couple, and you can watch them. Um, they do everything together. It's really precious to watch, so keep that in mind next time you guys are out at the zoo. But are you guys ready to meet our next friend? All right, let's see who we have next. Yeah. Oh, it's gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It's called the Seafood oh, Watch Guide. So, you guys, we have a little guy next. Sticking with our bird theme a little bit. And this here is Otis. I know you have to come around, so for you guys over here, don't worry. You'll be able to get a good look at this little guy. Um, but he's one of the favorite animals that we work with. He is an owl. 
so hot. Now, I know it's far away, you guys can't get a very good look at him, but who here thinks he's a baby owl? Anyone think he's a little baby? Yes. All right, now who here thinks he's an adult? No. no All right, pretty half and half. Otis is eight years old. What? I know. He is a little eastern screech owl. He is full grown, and he actually has a really interesting story. So eastern screech owls are a native species. walking 
a dog with a collar and a leash. It's just some extra precaution for us. But Otis, before we left the zoo, he made the choice to step up onto our glove, and he knows where exactly he needs to stand in his travel train that has a nice perch on it too, or like a little branch. And then right before he came out to participate again, he just steps right up. So these guys are um, very involved in what they get to do or what they want to or don't want to do. Um, but Otis here, and we talked about molting for penguins. Flight of birds molt too. Um, you might notice that his feathers are a little bit ruffled. It kind of looks like he's wearing a little skirt right now. Um, here in the next month or so, those will all be smoothed out. But flighted birds, they go through a molting process that's much longer so that they can continue to have enough feathers on their bodies to successfully fly and hunt. Um, but one of the good things about Otis molting right now is you can see all of his feathers are kind of fluffed up. Did you see some of those uh, little holes, essentially, in between his feathers? So these guys are known as silent birds of flight. So if you guys take your hand and you go like this next to your ear, do you hear all of that wind that kind of passes past your ear? Now, if you open up your palm and now you do it, can you hear that air as much? No, it's almost totally silent. So that's pretty much how an owl's feathers are set up. They're serrated. So when they are flying, all of that extra air goes through your wings instead of pushing against it and making a sound. Um, there was actually a study done that had an owl fly over a super sensitive microphone and there was zero sound. Now, why do they need to make zero sound when they're hunting? If you can imagine if one of your main um, animals that you want to hunt is a mouse, they have excellent hearing. So he wants to be able, once he's pinpointed that mouse or even heard that mouse, he is going to want to make sure he can still completely sneak up on it because he's going to be coming from a pretty tall branch. Um, but if you saw Otis walk around, did you see those little feathers on the top of his head? So sometimes people think those are his little ears. That's kind of, you know, what naturally if you think of a dog, their ears are at the top of their head. Owls are a little bit different. They actually have ears on the front of their face at kind of a diagonal. Now they have excellent hearing and having those ears kind of towards the front of your face, they really helps you pinpoint where your prey is. So if you are hunting at night, of course he has excellent vision, but he has to be able to really probably hear that animal before he even sees it. So this here is Otis. Um, if you guys are interested in having more wildlife in your backyards, since these guys are actually um, a native species, if you go online to the National Audubon Society's website, there is actually a step-by-step -step guide on how to build an owl box. Um, now you can even just buy them online. There's a lot of different companies that will sell them pre-made. Um, but owls are naturally really lazy at making nests. Um, you're not really going to see an owl, like if you picture a robin or a sparrow, how they're flying around picking up tiny little pieces to go back and build their nest. Owls will just kick out a robin or a sparrow from the nest that they have dedicated so much time to building and raise their young in there. Um, so if you find a good spot to put that owl box, make sure it's not too close to a branch or a squirrel will take over. Um, but it's a really good way to have these things to you as an excellent form of pest control. Um, so something that happens to a lot of native species around here, if there are rodent poisons used, Typically, this exact same thing happens to any of those animals that might eat some of those rodents. Um, so just by having an owl a little bit closer, you're probably going to have less mice that make their way into their house. Now, we were just in our own backyards. We met an animal from South Africa. Now we're going to be going down to Australia. And we'll see here. If you guys think you know what this animal is, when she comes up on the table, raise your hand. Whoa. You just pick up a porcupine. All right, I see yeah. some hands. Who here thinks this is a porcupine? I love those. Not a porcupine. Okay. What about? Does anyone think she's a hedgehog? Yeah. Not a hedgehog either. I'm really throwing you guys off. She is called an echidna. Has anyone heard of an echidna before? A couple of you. Very nice. You guys are a little animal experts. So most people have never heard of this animal before or even seen one. So uh, this is Edna, the echidna. It's spelled E-C-H-I-D-N-A. So obviously it's spelled as weird as it sounds. But if you have heard of the platypus, 
This is their closest living cousin. So I know she doesn't quite look exactly like a platypus, but as she walks around, you might be able to see that long beak. So she's known as a short-beaked echidna. There are also three different species of long-beaked echidna. These guys are doing really well out in Australia, but something that makes the platypus and the echidna so special is they are the two mammals, the only two mammals in the world, that actually lay eggs to reproduce. Yeah, so you think how is that possibly a mammal then? Don't mammals have to give life birth? Typically, yes. Um, but Edna, the echidna, and the platypus will actually lay a little leathery egg. So if you've ever seen like a snake egg or a lizard egg, how it's kind of soft and leathery, that's similar to what hers would look like. It's about the size of a grape. And another animal that you're going to find throughout Australia, let's think of some animals that have pouches. Can someone tell me what those animals are called or one of an example? A kangaroo, that's an example of one. You might think of, what's your guess? A koala, exactly. So then you also have your marsupials, a lot of marsupials living in Australia. Um, but they have their pouches, right? So do you guys think Edna makes a little nest when she lays her egg and just sits on it like a bird? That, would, that wouldn't work very well. You're gonna have to find your food. You don't wanna leave your little egg or something's probably gonna eat it. So just like a kangaroo or koala, those marsupials, Edna actually has a little pouch that she's gonna carry her egg in too. Um, so it's not quite as deep as um, a kangaroo or koala's and it's not actually gonna have the opening towards the top of her body. So you may have seen a little bit, you guys in the front, when Edna was picked up out of her travel crate, a bunch of dirt fell off of her. And that's perfectly normal. When we travel with our ambassador animals, we wanna make sure they stay nice and safe and secure. Edna feels the safest when she is covered in dirt. So her travel crate's full of dirt, her half of her house is full of dirt, and she's an excellent digger. So typically out in Australia, if you kind of picture how often we see groundhogs, that's kind of how common the echidnas are around Australia. But you're also going to find them along the surface or just underneath the ground. But we're talking about that pouch. If she had a pouch like a kangaroo that has the opening towards the front of her body and you're in the ground all the time, you're basically just going to fill your pouch up with dirt. So echidnas, these guys have adapted to actually have their pouch open on the opposite direction. So when she is climbing around, she doesn't have to worry about anything getting in there and she can keep her egg nice and secure. So once she does, that egg is gonna hatch and the egg is just gonna hatch inside her pouch and out comes a tiny little puggle, which is a little baby echidna. Now, if you guys know anything about kangaroos or koalas, Typically, when they give birth, their babies are about the size of a jelly bean. Very similar with these guys. It's just a tiny little pink starfish. And that baby's gonna live in the pouch, drink milk. So she's a mammal still, even though she lays eggs. So she's gonna drink milk out of the pouch. And of course, she's not covered in spines as that baby grows up. But once that baby reaches the point where it starts to grow spines, it's time to be out on your own. Um, but when Edna first came out here, I know most people think she's a porcupine or she's a hedgehog, and completely understandable. You're going to relate a lot of animals based on how they look. And she is covered in spines. So if you think of a porcupine, they are covered in quills, and quills are a little bit different. Has ever, anyone ever seen a picture of like a dog or an animal that's run into a porcupine and they have quills stuck all over their face? So when that happens though, it's because those quills fall off on contact. So sometimes people think that porcupines can shoot their quills. That's a total myth, but when they do make contact, they fall off so fast, it almost looks like they're shooting out. Um, but since she's covered in spines, of course, Calvin's hands aren't full of spines right now. So they're more like our hair. They're just modified hairs that are nice and solid, but they're still pokey at the end and they look like a porcupine or a hedgehog because they protect themselves the same way. So has anyone heard of a dingo before? Anyone heard of one? So a couple people, dingoes are the Australia's wild dog. And
and that's going to be probably their main predator out in Australia. Um, and of course, if you are a dog, these guys are most likely descended from wolves, so they're going to be hunting with their paws, touching with their mouths, and if you're covered in spines, you're not going to look very appetizing. Um, so Edna here, she is found along the ground or can just under the surface, and if she is being hunted by a dingo, if you look at her, you're not going to think, well, she's not going to see that dingo from far away. She's probably not going to smell it super quickly because dingoes move fast. So these guys actually have special receptors underneath her strange little nose and mouth that help detect all of those vibrations. Um, so if there's a dingo on the opposite side of this auditorium running towards her, she's going to feel that that animal is coming really fast and start digging. And she can bury herself easily in 30 seconds and she's going to bury so that all of her only her tail is exposed so she just looks like a little spike ball but if there is a really hungry dingo coming and it's starting to dig at you she has really strange little back claws too that are shaped like c's and she uses them pretty much like a corkscrew and will twist them into the ground so that she is totally secure so they're perfectly adapted for living in Australia and defending themselves from dingoes. But recently, these guys um, are more fall prey to uh, domesticated dogs and cats. So they've gotten crafty and will actually flip them. Um, so that's one of those main threats for an echidna. So just having their pets in their wildlife too. So you guys, the last animal that we're, I'm going to talk about before we switch over to our mingle is going to use this perch. We'll see. So this animal is probably the animal that people get most excited about now. We'll see. So she likes it nice and quiet. So I know when she comes out, people are always like, oh my gosh. But I'll let, I'll let the anticipation build. <gasps> All right. It looks like some of you can see her. This is Sunny. <laughs> She is a two-toed sloth. Now, sloths have probably become the most popular animal we work with. Have, who here has seen Zootopia? I'm, I figured. So, Zootopia really made sloths super popular. I'm sure we all know of Flash. And she was a three-toed sloth. So, we have three-toed sloths and two-toed sloths. Now, I kind of gave it away, How did you get but here? you guys see, in the front, I she has Robert. two toes. All sloths, no matter if they're two or three toed, have three digits in the back. So if you guys want to know what type they are, always look at those front two paws to see what type of animal you're looking at. But you're going to find sloths in Central and South America. Uh, typically, though, up at probably like where the ceiling is. So you're going to find them up in the canopies the rainforest and I know they are really people get so excited to see a sloth but I can promise you they are the most boring animals that Calvin and I work with these guys a lot of people are like oh my gosh I, I relate so much to a sloth they truly do sleep about 16 to 18 hours a day um, and basically out in Central and South America where these guys are found their main goal in life is to not move and not be seen. And that's because there are a lot of predators that if they spot a sloth, they're not getting away. These guys are the slowest moving land mammals. And so she is doing exactly what she's going to be doing out in her native habitat. If she's hanging, that is a perfectly neutral position for a sloth. So it's just like us sitting down. If you guys can imagine hanging like that for hours on end, I think my, oh gosh, that sounds so terrible. But for her, if you see 